we have for our speaker this evening, Reverend Henry Kick, who is the director of the Christian Guidance Center in Grand Rapids. Uh, Reverend Kick is a graduate of Polk College, Western Theological Seminary, and Michigan State University. He is well known in this area, having given commencement addresses at several schools in our vicinity. I'm sure that he left something of great value and interest for the graduates we honored this evening. And the title of his address is The Bridge on the River Life. It gives me a great deal of pleasure at this time to present to you Reverend King. Thank you, Mr. Rock Schaefer. Certainly I identify this evening with the graduating class and somehow I read anxiety in some of them as they identified in the processional. And I want to say that I had a lot of anxiety too. And the reason for that being that I wondered whether or not I would get here. Not that my little Volkswagen was giving me any particular uh, problems uh, on the way up here from Grand Rapids. But I'd have to roll back the calendar a long way to explain what I mean when I say that I had anxiety too, wondering whether or not uh, I would arrive here to be able to address these graduates, their parents, the faculty, relatives, and members of the board. You see, I had a very, very difficult time getting through high school. While I was in the 10th grade, I considered my problem, and before they asked me to leave high school, I quit. Not because, as a student, I was raising particular hob, not because I was a problem in the area of discipline necessarily, but I was flunking altogether too many subjects. I tried Latin three times and did not succeed. I flunked algebra twice, geometry I never got. I had a D in history and a C in English. I had straight A's in ROTC, manual training, band, orchestra, and glee club. But they weren't willing to give me a diploma on the basis of that A record, and so I quit before I completed the 10th grade, went into road construction for my father. So I know what a hard day's work is. And at the age of 21, I had a definite religious experience in my life and felt that I should go into the ministry, and this necessitated my return to school. And so at the age of 21, I returned to high school and finally graduated from high school, think of it, at the age of 23. Now you honor students are wondering, well, now how did you do academically? You flunked so many at the beginning. How did you finally get along academically when you graduated from high school? And the answer is simply this, that academically, when I did graduate from high school at the age of 23, I was scholastically the fourth highest in my graduating class. Now, I don't want you to get the idea that this Hollander is bragging. The thing that really helped me out was this, that there were only seven in the graduating class. <laughs> so I think you can understand my anxiety when I say, well, I, I almost didn't make it. And really, uh, all of us uh, really want to make it not only in life, but we want to make it through life. We want to have a sense of accomplishment. We want to have a sense of being. I think all of us want to feel accepted. We all want to be loved. And certainly I see this day by day in the process of counseling, not only with adolescents, but also with adults. And yet to be realistic, we know that we may have anxiety because we have fear whether or not we'll make it through life. A few months ago, I went to New York City to attend the American Association of Pastoral Counselors. And while there, I crossed the George Washington Bridge. Bridges somehow fascinate me. I go over a few, but as an avid canoeist, I go under many bridges and sometimes under the water too. But I noticed on this bridge that there were many, many policemen. 
not because there was a riot, but over the years they discovered that many people who were not seemingly making it through life used the George Washington Bridge as a means of destroying their lives. They'd simply jump over into the river and end it all. And to decrease the death rate through suicide, they uh, placed uh, policemen at strategic positions in the bridge, trying to keep people from ending their lives. It is said that one man suddenly got out of his car and he took off his coat and looked over the railing of that bridge and just as he was about to jump over that railing and destroy his life, a policeman grabbed him, pulled him back and said to him, now see here, what are you trying to do? And the man said, well, I don't want to live. I, I want to end my life. And the cop said, well, well, why do you want to end your life? And he said, well, uh, I never made it through college. I've lost my job. My wife has divorced me. My children won't have anything to do with me. And really, that there's nothing worth living for, and I want to end it all. And the cop said, now, listen here. It isn't quite that bad. Haven't you heard that every cloud has a silver lining? Let's sit down and, and talk uh, here for a few minutes on the curbstone of the bridge. And so the cop gave him these sayings, well, every cloud has a silver lining. Tomorrow will be a better day. Don't you know that the first 100 years are the hardest in life? And so the would-be suicide and the cops sat there for about 20 minutes and they, they talked about life. And when they got through, they both jumped over the railing. <laughs> now you see there was something wrong with both of these individuals. One, I guess, was a pessimist and didn't see much hope. And the other was an unrealistic optimist. And when he began to analyze his philosophy of life, it uh, didn't have too much content. And so in a sense, they identified in a problem situation together. They didn't think that they would make it. You know, young graduates, I want to say that with all sincerity in the observations that I make, you tonight in a unique sense stand on the bridge on the river life. I think that you are at possibly the most important stage of your lifespan because essentially now you are emancipating. And by that we mean you're going from adolescence into adulthood. In a sense, you're on your own. And we as educators and we as parents, yes, we, we have to let you go. We may have a certain amount of anxiety about this. We wonder how you're going to handle life or how is life going to handle you. And I want to say that here, not only do I have a great challenge in speaking to young people, but I also believe that I have a great deal of anxiety. Why? Well, I think because we deal with persons every day in a counseling relationship. You might expect me tonight to talk about the world situation. You might um, expect me to talk about a lot of things that you are knowledgeable of because of your education, because of your sense of awareness of contemporary events that are disturbing and rocking not only our nation, but the world. But I'm not going to talk to you about that. Because we notice that the greatest threat to life is the fact that many people who stand on the bridge on the river life simply cannot cope with life situations. We stand in the midst of a great revolution, and that revolution is in the field of communication and transportation, in the field of education, in the world of work, 
in practically every important field of life there is a great revolution. And so great has that revolution been in the past years that seemingly there is a cleavage between adolescents and parents and parents and adolescents. I know because I've got four of them straining at the bit at home right now. And there's a lack of understanding. We who are our parents sometimes don't understand the adolescent world and we become judgmental. And likewise, sometimes as young people, we don't understand how our parents look at life and we begin to become confused and uh, we conflict. We either become unrealistic in our idealism or we become terribly pessimistic. And so I'd like to talk with you just for a few moments about the importance of making it through life by the mature decisions that we feel that you should make. For that we believe which hinders accomplishment more than anything else is the lack of emotional or mental health. Now, I'm not saying that we're mentally ill. We all are not mentally healthy. It's a matter of degree. But I'm saying how we feel about ourselves and how we look at life. And much of this do because of that revolution, even in the area of music, for example. I, I just love the number that the band played this evening. I used to be in the band at the different high schools that I attended. Yes, I even played under the direction of John Philip Sousa. Again, I'm not bragging, but I was chosen as a drummer out of one of the high schools in Grand Rapids to have him conduct a number we played, The Stars and Stripes Forever. So I always say I played under his direction. It kind of helps my ego a little bit. But you know, when you think of popular music today, for example, I think it is far different from the popular music we had when we were your age. I was a trap drummer in a jazz orchestra many, many years ago. And the worst number that we had then was the number, yes, we have no bananas. But at least you could understand the words. In my home, all I hear is, yeah, 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 or I, I like it, I like it, or don't let it rain, there's a hole in the roof. <laughs> or I hear my my teenagers in my home repeating over and over again, love, 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 love. And I'm a marriage counselor and I'm a courtship counselor and I just think that they're just terribly confused. I even fear, yeah, I even fear that my own children will be my clients sometime. <laughs> well, I imagine you're wondering what I'm driving at. Well, maybe I don't know. And maybe you say, this is an unusual approach in addressing graduates. Well, I want it to be unusual, if for no other reason than to disturb your thinking. And even when you're hot-rodding it a little bit after the exercise, remember me. You see, as you look at life and you stand at this point of decision-making for the future. Remember that as you think of your position, your position is of great importance. And there may even be a danger in talking about idealism without being realistic. And therefore, I want to say for you to possess may mean that you do not have. Now you possess your diploma this evening. It cannot be taken away from you. This is an accomplishment. This is part not only of knowledge that you have acquired, but it is part of your personality formation. It is really part of your future, and we are so thankful for it. But I want to say that there are many people who think that they possess and yet they do not have. 
For example, today, if we are uh, 17, 16, 18 years of age, and we are the male of the species, we have to have a car. That car has to be a convertible, and it has to be red. But to possess this car is, in a sense, difficult. We're going to school. Parents don't have the money. But we turn on the radio and we hear that song that was popular only a few years ago, a dollar down, a dollar a week. And so, as adolescents or young adults, we get the red convertible. You see, it's a status symbol. And it's a real help because maybe the person who has the red convertible has his eyes on a blonde down the street and he thinks if I have the red convertible I'll be able to date her and so he drives past her home and she's looking through the window and she shouts oh dad mom look he's got a red convertible but she doesn't realize that as of this hour there is owing banks and loan agencies over $28 billion for automobiles. You see, that's why we have drive-in banks today so that the car can drive up and see the rightful owner once in a while. You see, he, he really doesn't have that car. And she knows he'll call, he'll be back, and she says, Dad, may I have a dollar thirty-seven cents? What do you want a dollar thirty-seven cents for? Well, I want to go down to the drugstore and get another bottle of Clairol. You see this idea of to possess and not to have? She thinks he has a car. He hasn't. He thinks he has a blonde. <laughs> See how this works? Well, all I want to say to you young people, remember that to possess sometimes does not necessarily mean to have. And therefore I say what you are is of great importance. Not the externalization of life, but what we know ourselves to be as persons. This is a primary importance. So I want to say that when you're standing on that bridge, accept yourself as you are. Oh, it's good to have status symbols. I've got one. You know, I mean, I can have a VW and they think I'm a doctor or a lawyer because well, anybody can have a VW and you don't know whether they're rich or poor. But it keeps my four children in school, I'll tell you that. To possess may not mean to have. What you are is important. I'd also like to say that people today feel that they are being pushed because we're living in a cruelly competitive age. And believe it or not, there are many influences that seek to push you off the bridge before you reach your goal in life. And you'd be surprised how many, many young people and young adolescents and young adults are being pushed off the bridge of life before they have a sense of being or an opportunity of accomplishment. And then sometimes we parents push. Yeah, I have three daughters and I have one son. He goes to JC. He's having some of the same difficulties that I had academically. This hurts my ego a little bit, you see. I'd like to have him be a preacher, or a doctor, or a missionary, or a lawyer. I'd settle for a lawyer or medicine so that I could retire early on his income. But you see, the tendency is to push. And I'd like to have him maybe appear to have accomplished without feeling comfortable within himself. And we parents sometimes push. I have a Chinese friend, and he had a lot of anxiety about his three daughters. Now, the Chinese last name was Tu, Mr. Tu, T-U. And he came to my office and uh, he said, I think that my three single daughters need counseling. And I said, why? He said, they're not getting married. And, I, and we Chinese believe in the family unit. And he said, I want my girls to be married. And, and it seems as if they're not going to get married. And I have a, a lot of anxiety about this. And I, I said, all right, Mr. Tu, you send 
your three daughters in and I'll talk to them and I'll try to find out why they are not getting married. I said, may I have their names, Mr. Toole? And he said, yes. First one was a girl by the name of Two Young Two. The next one was Two Dumb Two. And the other one's name was No Yen Two. So, I mean, you see, he, he, he was pushing, but the odds were against him. And you will say, well, my parents aren't pushing me. No, but some of the things in life that may have happened to you may cause what we call unconscious motivation. And you're either being pushed in some realms of life from the outside, or you are being pushed from the inside. And I say to you, seek excellence. Pursue excellence to the utmost of the capacities that you have. And I want to say, though I am not an educator, I have as much respect for the well-motivated C student as I do for the B student and for the A student. And I have just as much respect for the well-motivated D student who is doing to the utmost of his capacity. And I say this with all the sincerity of my ministry. Because if we don't believe this, then life becomes cruelly competitive and unconsciously we may, because of this, push ourselves in the wrong direction. That's why I have something to say about the Selective Service Act, which really shows great discrimination. And I do not think it is fair to all the young men in our nation. Well, what has this to do with the bridge on the river life? Simply this, young people, we want you as persons to get across it and get across it well, move well, cover ground, know where you've been, know where you're going. I looked at my speedometer on the way up here, almost 63,000 miles. She'll click that on the way back. But if my wife were to ask me, dear, where have you been, if she reads 63,000 miles, I, I simply don't know where I've been. And I think that most of us would say the same thing as, as we think of modern transportation. Where have you been? Many of us would not be able to give an account of, of where we've been traveling all these miles. And you know, we're really on the go. I got up 5.30 this morning because Three more days and my 16-year-old daughter, this temporary driving permit will, you know, flip and she won't be able to get her driver's license. So there I was, trying to get her to back up and go forward and all that. So I'm rather tired. I got up rather early, had a rough day at the office. How do I keep awake going back to Grand Rapids? I play a game. I see a lot of movement on the highway. And then I find out who's married and who's single. You say, how do you do that? Do you stop the car and make a survey? No, not at all. If I see two men in the front seat, two women in the back seat, I put a mark down, they're married. But if suddenly a car driven by a two-headed monster passes me, they're really on the move, you see. I remember one time I was out riding with my wife, and we were going along in silence, and she said, you know, dear, we don't sit as close together when we go out for a ride as we used to. I said, dear, that's right. And I was silent for a few moments, and then I turned to her, and I said, dear, you will notice that I haven't moved. <laughs> well... You say, what does this all mean? Why do we laugh? Because we know that some of these things are so true. And what I'm driving at, graduates, is simply this. That you have 
now, tonight, come to a point in your life that's very important. I'm really with you. As I sat here, I thought some of you ra look rather tense. The girls stood erect, but you ought to see their eyes wiggle as they stood there, from side to side, you know? And I thought, I wish I could know each one personally and have you talk about yourself, about your hopes, about the great challenges, but also your fears, your frustrations, your loneliness, maybe even inferiority complex or two, and be able to tell you with all the sincerity of the evaluations that we make in all of the interpersonal relationships in counseling, that I have long ceased to speak academically or try to be profound or try to give statistics or try to interpret the world situation. Why? Because day after day after day I see the important factor in life. After we pursue excellence and we discharge our duty before God and man, that we get to know ourselves, improve ourselves, and accept ourselves and recognize personage and that each one of us is important in the whole pattern of life. You may be afraid in a sense as you look at life and you anticipate tomorrow. I want to say that you need not be afraid. Those who constructed the Golden Gate Bridge anticipated that for every certain amount of money there would be one tragic death in the construction of that bridge. And mathematically, they anticipated on that bridge as they did at the bridge at the Straits of Mackinac how many workmen would be killed. There's a ratio of this. And they're killed because, usually, of the fear of heights. And so the contractors did this. They purchased a large net, and they strung this underneath the bridge that was being constructed. And any man working on the Golden Gate Bridge knew that if he would fall, he might be injured a little, but he would be safe. He would fall into the net. I would be remiss in my observed and ordained duty if I did not say to you that you must have under the bridge of life a sense of security. And this relates to a living personal relationship to God which is accomplished in Christ. And we need not fear or when he accepts us in his Son, we know that we are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And you'll know, young people, no matter what tomorrow brings, underneath are the everlasting arms. So tonight I'm with you on the bridge. In a sense, I feel that I know you tonight. But above all, as you stand at this crucial moment, accept yourselves as persons, pursue excellence, and remember this, that what you are as persons is of primary importance and will help you make all the decisions in life and make them well. So we met tonight, kind of in a counseling relationship. You may soon forget what I have said, but may you always remember this one thing, that the decisions that you make as young people tonight will determine the integrity, the challenge, 
the well-being and the glory of all of your lives tomorrow. Success to you, lots of happiness, lots of fun. May God give you the good things of life and of his kingdom.